time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this evening? Mr. William Bradford Huey, noted author and analyst and editor-in-chief of the Longines Chronoscope, and Colonel Elson Talbert, an editor of the New York Herald Tribune. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Mr. Miles J. Lane, United States Attorney. Mr. Lane, you of course are now one of the most famous crime fighters in the United States since your office is Handle the Hiss case, the Frank Costello case, the Remington case, the Rosenberg case. So I'm sure that our viewers would like you to tell us something about these cases tonight, sir. Now, first of all, the Rosenberg case, where this man and his wife were facing electrocution. Just what is the crime for which the Rosenbergs were convicted? <clears throat> well, they were convicted for conspiring to violate, violate the espionage laws of the United States in that uh, they had uh, conspired to, among other things, to turn over the secrets of the atom bomb to the Soviet Union. And both this man and his wife are now facing electrocution unless the president intercedes. Is that correct, sir? That's correct. Now, I'm wondering uh, if the Rosenbergs have given the government any help since their conviction or given any indication that they would like to help the government in uncovering other Soviet spies. To this moment, the Rosenbergs have not cooperated at all. They've given us no information, and they've been very adamant as far as cooperation is concerned. Well, Could they save their lives if they talked? Well, let me say this. I think that the, the American government is quite uh, reasonable, and uh, if they were to uh, cooperate to the fullest extent, I'm quite sure that that would be taken into consideration with respect to what uh, w might happen to them in the future. Well, now, with, with all of your experience with them and in the trial, sir, do you have any theories as to why they, they have refused to give the government any information at all? Well, I'm, I'm certain from what I've seen of them that they are dyed in wool communists and that they are, they are completely uh, devoted to the Soviet Union and to them it's more or less of a cause and they probably believe that they're martyrs to a cause or something to that effect. Now do you think that it's that it's terribly important that our government uh, uh, force them to talk or else execute them? Well uh, you put that question rather an odd way. Uh, I think it's very important to this government that we take a firm attitude not only towards the Rosenbergs but towards anybody that uh, conspires in any way to, to uh, overthrow this country or to commit acts of espionage against it. You think that perhaps it might have some effect on future cases if, you, if these people do not talk on how much information you, we might get out of future cases? Well, I think it uh, will have a, a direct bearing upon future cases if uh, we don't uh, take a very firm attitude now, could you respect. illustrate for our viewers, sir, just how extensive was their knowledge about some of our secret activities? Uh, during the course of the trial, there was testimony that the Rosenbergs uh, had information uh, respecting uh, such things as our, our fire control system, uh, atomic energy for airplanes. They also had uh, some knowledge of this rocket that uh, was in contemplation at one time called the Sky Platform, which was a huge rocket, which was to be sp sent into space and held there, and uh, at, uh, through a system of electronics, it could come down and destroy a city. They also had uh, uh, information, uh, as it was developed at the trial, respecting our, our fire control and uh, our underwater detection of submarines. Then it isn't true, sir, that they were very small fish. A great many Americans, I'm sure, 
uh, wondering uh, if they weren't inconsequential people. That, is, from your experience, that is not true. They were rel relatively high up in the apparatus. Well, I don't know just how high up they were, but <coughs> I think that uh, the Rosenbergs were very important in the apparatus, or one of the apparatuses. Well, now, you've, uh, you've just secured the conviction of uh, William Remington, I believe, for a crime somewhat similar to the crime of Alger Hiss. Isn't that correct, Mr. Lane? Uh, both Hiss and Remington were uh, convicted for perjury. And uh, one of the counts upon which Remington was convicted was for having given over secret or classified information to a representative of the Communist Party who was also a, a Soviet courier. Hiss was convicted for perjury in denying uh, that he had ever given over any uh, information or classified or secret information from the State Department to, uh, I believe it was Whitaker Chambers. So in both instances, although they were both Remington and Hiss were convicted for perjury, it was perjury for uh, lying, in effect, uh, when they were asked whether or not they had given over any classified information to others outside of the government department. Well, there there's no doubt about the fact that both of these men were members of this apparatus which you've just described, is there? No, well, I wouldn't say that. Uh, they certainly knew uh, people who were communists, but whether or not they, they were actually members of the Communist Party, it's difficult to say. Uh, Remington, of course, was also uh, convicted for having lied when he said that uh, he had no knowledge of the Young Communist League at Dartmouth, and in the course of the trial, we uh, developed that he s had many contacts with communists, and he attended Communist Party meetings and so forth. Well, incidentally, that young communist league at Dartmouth, sir, uh, interjected a rather human note in the trial. I believe you're an alumnus of Dartmouth, aren't you? Well, uh, <laughs> I happen to be the president of the general alumni at Dartmouth, and uh, naturally, with so many Dartmouth men being needled, and uh, ribbed a little bit, uh, respecting the fact that there were communists at Dartmouth in the late 30s. I was most anxious that uh, Remington be convicted, not only because I felt he was guilty, but also because of the fact that I was a Dartmouth man, and as the prosecutor of Remington, I don't think it uh, hurt the college too much to have a Dartmouth man <laughs> put Remington away. Well, would you say that you had the full support of the Dartmouth alumni in this matter? I would say without fear of contradiction that I had the 100% support of every Dartmouth alumnus uh, in existence. Well, sir, I'm sure that our viewers uh, would expect to hear from you the latest report on the Costello case. What's Costello doing now? Well, Costello was convicted, as you know, for contempt of the Senate, and he is now in Milan prison. Uh, yesterday, we started an action against him in connection with a lien on his income taxes for roughly uh, $480,000. And we also have a denaturalization case against him in the office, which should come on for hearing or trial in the not too distant future. Well, in all of this uh, very interesting experience that you've had, sir, the one that's in the news most tonight is the waterfront situation in New York. Now, can you give our viewers uh, outside of New York some indication of how extensive graft is on the waterfront? Well, we have had, as you know, there are several, uh, there's a state crime commission working here on the waterfront and uh, doing an excellent job. And uh, I have had a grand jury working for the past 10 months. And that has done a magnificent job also. In the course of, uh, of their d deliberations and probings, we have found uh, extensive uh, uh, evidence, of, or rather evidence of extensive uh, corruption and, uh, and kickbacks and all that sort of thing. And does this corruption affect uh, every American family in some way, would you say? In view of the fact that uh, New York is the greatest port in the world and uh, the commerce of New York uh, way out, uh, out distances that of any other, I would say that the corruption and the kickbacks and all that sort of thing in New York City affects the life of every single American, and I think it uh, is of particular interest to every housewife in America because the graft and the kickbacks will affect the price of every commodity 
that's being used by every family in the United States. Mr. Lane, you've uh, prosecuted successfully gangsters, uh, communists, and racketeers. I'm wondering what you think is the nation's greatest menace. Well, if I were to pick out any one thing as the uh, greatest menace that this nation faces is, is the complacency of a lot of our, our citizens. I mean, uh, I think the American public uh, is, is sufficiently intelligent, probably the most intelligent public in the world, and I have all the confidence in the world in it. However, uh, I think that we've got to realize that it's time for us to accept the responsibilities as citizens, and by that I mean this, that we should have more people interested in doing jury duty, and also taking an interest in parent-teachers clubs, and taking a very intense interest in the future of the younger people of the country. Well, as, as a final question, Mr. Lane, a great deal has been written and said about the part that labor unions may have had to do with the waterfront uh, scandals. Now, are you going, do you expect to get the cooperation of, of the American Federation of Labor in the investigations? Oh, I think the American Federation has shown that it, it's with us 100%. I don't think that uh, labor itself is at fault a bit. I think labor, in labor, they have a few unscrupulous leaders, uh, but management also has a few in its ranks. Now, I have every confidence in labor, and I'm sure the American, lab uh, the American Federation of Labor will do everything it can to cleanse itself of the wrong elements. Well, thank you, sir, for being with us this evening. Thank you. The opinions that you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Colonel Elsel Talbert. Our distinguished guest was Mr. Miles J. Lane, United States Attorney. Longine is a superior watch in every respect. In fact, it's one of the finest watches made anywhere in the world. Yet Longine is in a class by itself. Thus, among the finest of the world's watches, Longine watches alone have won 10 World's Fair grand prizes and 28 gold medals at World's Fairs and international expositions. And in the competitive accuracy trials organized by great government observatories, the brilliant record of Longine over the years is a surpassing achievement. Yes, Longines is in a class by itself, for Longines is the world's most honored watch. So when next you buy a watch, either to indulge yourself or to give boundless pleasure to another, by all means, see and examine the Longines watches now at your authorized jeweler agency. In style, they're the last word in good taste. In construction, they are faultless. In performance, they'll satisfy your every need. Among the finest watches of the world, there is but one Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Wetnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Wetnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. This Sunday night, Ed Sullivan presents the Walt Disney Story on the CBS Television Network.